Hello everyone, welcome to our talk, Securing the Supply Chain, Zero Trust Builds with Intel Inspire. Let me start by introducing my, myself, there I am right there. Um, I'm a solutions architect at Boxboat Technology. I also lead um, a lot of our technical initiatives are at, at Boxboat dealing with the federal and high compliance industries. Um, I'm a contributor to the CNCF SIG Security Supply Chain Working Group. Right now, we are working on a supply chain security white paper. Hopefully, by the time you see this video, it will be released or, or soon to be released. So, so be on the lookout for that. Um, I'll, I'll be posting it on my LinkedIn and Twitter <clears throat> once it becomes available. I work in defense, uh, banking, and utilities. Uh, you know, Generally, those high compliance environments or high compliance verticals. Uh, Right. They, they all want to move to DevSecOps, but they have all this baggage and regulation involved with it. It makes it very, very difficult to, to do that. So, so we help them out there. And then with me, I have Mikhail Swift. Uh, he's an amazing engineer. Uh, he's a DevOps engineer uh, with us at Boxboat uh, as well. He, he contributes with me to that white paper I talked about. And then he works on the U.S. Air Force uh, platform one. So he helps bring some of their mission partners on board. So if you think like these large, traditional, slow-moving uh, defense inter integrators, right? They need to, as the U.S. Air Force moves into a DevSecOps environment, they need to bring these large integrators. Uh, so Mikhail's working on a team that is really helping enable one of those large integrators to, to work in that U.S. Air Force platform. I'm really proud of the work he's doing there. Uh, and then I'll talk about a little bit about Boxboat. Uh, we are a professional services uh, company. Uh, I like to call us a cloud native integrators. So we can take your, you know, your business requirements and then we take the cloud native landscape and come up with a plan to really accelerate your, your DevOps journey and your digital modern. Uh, but let's get to the problem at hand, right? Uh, there was some stuff that happened. Uh, this past winter, and it really kind of shook the entire industry. Um, security administrators are finally trying to figure out that they have no way to assess the risk level of software running on their systems, right? It, it's a system based upon trust. Um, and that's a problem, right? Because a lot of organizations don't even sign their artifacts or any other metadata. It, 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 we look at the open source community, right? It's even a larger problem. And it all goes back to, right, how do we sign those artifacts, right? It becomes very difficult, especially when you're a large distributed organization, to distributing those that private key material and setting the system. If you've ever worked in a large corporation and have tried to do some sort of uh, request for certificates, you understand that the process is different everywhere. And it's generally very streamlined, right? It's something that, that takes, you know, multiple levels of approval, uh, and can take multiple days. So it just is a really difficult thing to do. Uh, and all this really boils down to is that sometimes when we deliver software faster, we're really delivering vulnerabilities. And in these high compliance environments, such as defense, banking, utilities, right? That's just not acceptable. We'd rather be slow and decades behind than have a system that's vulnerable. Um, now we all know that, you know, existing systems that haven't been patched are vulnerable, but we can't introduce new vulnerabilities into a system uh, and we just can't move fast enough to have the assurance that we, we know that that's happening. Uh, so when I opened this talk, I talked about zero trust. That's a, that's a big marketing. And I kind of want to break that down a little. And, and there's this idea, right, that, that zero trust architecture is a product that you can buy, but that, that's just not... Right? It's an architecture, it's a design decision that, that your company or your organization needs to make. Um, and I like to distill a zero trust architecture. It's three, uh, three points. So you have identity, that is your workload's identity based upon the attributes of that, the immutable attributes of that workload, uh, such as a container hash, the uh, process binary hash, right? Uh, there has to be something about that workload that I uniquely identifies it or identifies it as a part of a group. Um, the same goes for users, right? Identity is not just workload identity, right? Most of us understand identity as a user identity. So we need to have strong identity systems for both users and workload. 
Uh, the next part is policy, right? So uh, traditionally, when we talk about policy, uh, we're talking about organizational policy, right? What can users do? What can administrators do? What are left and right limits? Uh, generally, in a traditional architecture, you have your policy that's managed by a change control board. So you bring a change to that change control board, and they'll examine the policy to know, hey, does, is this going to go? Can this go into production based upon our policy? It's a very slow process. It really doesn't work with a DevSecOps methodology. Um, so what we do in a zero trust architecture is we take that policy and we, we, we enable it as policy as code, right? So we have our left and right limits defined as some piece of automation. Um, you know, open policy agent is a great tool to do this. And then finally we have control, right? What is actually taking these identity documents and policy documents to make decisions in the system? So an example here may be that, you know, it, if you have a network policy that says two workloads can talk to each other, right? You need some sort of controller that, that actuates those IP tables to make that. Um, so when you have these three things working together, you do have a zero trust architecture. And you take these three ideas and you can apply them to just about any problem in your space and, and design it securely. So when we apply it to the CICD pipeline, we see that there's a uh, a traditional CI CD pipeline, all of the data uh, that is collected or generated during the build process is thrown away and, and not distributed along with the artifact. That, that metadata is extremely important to attesting the validity of, of that software, that it was built on the machines you expected it to be built on, it was built by the compilers you expected it to be built on, there was no man-in-the-middle attacks that, that modified the code in between these different processes. You, you want to have that assurance that your vendors did the right thing there before you deploy uh, the software into mission-critical systems. And right now, we're placing our trust in the process. We're saying, oh, okay, you signed that artifact, so we're going to trust it in our system. And you know the events of this past winter or past year, 2020, with, uh, with, with some of the supply chain attacks we've seen, we just see that that's not the case, right? We cannot trust external processes in our mission critical system. We need to place trust in data, not the process. So this means we need to move to a system of evidence-based trust rather than a signature-based trust. Um, and and this, is, this is somewhat of a new idea. I know, uh, the NTIA uh, and MITRE have been working on this for the past couple of years. And there's a paper called Deliver Uncompromised that, that MITRE released a couple months ago. And it really kind of explains this concept and expands upon it. And you have this idea of, a, of an S box. This is a, a piece of metadata that is emitted from each step of the build process. And we take those S bombs, those signed S bombs, and you know, put them all together we, and use it and deliver them to the execution phase, right? We can actually use a controller at the execution phase to determine whether we trust that software or not. And that allows our system administrators to examine that software to make sure that it does meet that organizational policy. Uh, we're placing our trust in signed data. We're placing our trust in public key infrastructure, not the process when we move to an evidence-based trust model for, for our control. Uh, the problem is that MITRE actually didn't release an implementation or any implementation guidance on it. So at Boxfoot, we kind of took it upon ourselves. Uh, you know, we, we've been working in supply chain and supply chain security for, you know, the entire history of our company. It, it's what we do. Uh, traditionally, we've been focused on delivering software faster, but as we moved into these high compliance environments, they have new requirements, right? They want to actually be able to trust that, that software. So we started looking at the Intoto project. Um, Intoto is a great project. It, it does what we need to do, right? It emits those SBOMs, that metadata, that signed metadata for each stage of the build process. It allows us to verify that by an out-of-band uh, policy enforcement. Uh, they call that a layout file, right? So that when you put these together, it allows you to cryptographically verify the build process wherever you are, right? So we can, we can verify that build process at the execution phase, not having to rely on um, trust of, of, that, of that business process from that vendor. That. Uh, 
Um, so how does this actually work? So uh, Total effectively decouples the build policy from the build process itself. So in a traditional build process, you may have a GitLab CI pipeline uh, that, that is enforced at some point, right? But if you're using, but once you leave that GitLab environment or that CI environment, you have no way to validate that, right? So what Intoto does is it gives us this out-of-band validation. Um, in, in, this, uh, in this diagram, you see there's a project owner, Diana. Right? She's going to define what that build policy is. She can say, hey, all my builds need to meet certain criteria. Um, and then each of the functionaries here are responsible for fulfilling or satisfying uh, those requirements. Each functionary, which could also be a, could be a person or an actual build step, uh, does require a private key to sign that metadata which kind of causes some issues when we bring this into an enterprise environment. So enter Spiffy Spire. Uh, you know, we're not going to do a real big deep dive into what Spiffy Spire uh, is and how it works. Uh, there's a lot of really, really great talks on that and a great active community. Uh, but Spiffy is the, or Spire is the implementation of the Spiffy APIs. It's a reference, reference implementation. It's what we used in this project here. Um, and Spire allows us to I issue identities in the form of X509 certificates to workloads based upon uh, their immutable attributes, container hash, what user. Right? There's, there's a lot of different selectors that we can pick up, including you know, what machine that they're being built on. In one of our engagement, we're actually able to tie issuing these identities down to a, uh, the public hash of that TPM key on that machine, right? So we can cryptographically prove that builds happen on a specific machine. Right, and so this allows us to register these functionaries to the Spire registration. Once we register these, these functionaries to the Spire registration API, those functionaries are issued the keys that we specify, and then they can sign that metadata and the whole process becomes automated. You know, we are able to, again, attest to the machine it was running on or the cloud environment it was running on, as well as a specific workload that is running on the. When we take those two projects and put them together, um, it allows us to create an automated architecture that, that implements that reference design that, that we talked about earlier that MITRE release and that de deliver uncompromised paper um, allows us to tell, allows us to attest for the workload identity, right? What, who built the software and where it was built. And allows us to pass that information downstream to consumers of the software so they can actually. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Bikhail and he's going to actually go over a demonstration of this working in action. Demo. Thanks, Cole. I'm going to give a quick demo of the work that we've done with Intoto Inspire. We have a sample Hello World project here. As part of this Hello World project, we've defined a simple build pipeline. It clones, build both a binary and a Docker image, scans a Docker image, and then finally uses Intoto to verify that image before it publishes it to a Docker registry. The only difference between this and any other pipeline that you've probably seen is that we wrap every command in an Intoto run. This allows Intoto to capture any materials, which are things that we use in our build, on our stage, and products, which are things that we create in our stage. We are also connecting to the Spiffy Spire uh, socket, which allows us to get and do some workload uh, attestation to make sure that we're actually verified to do this and we're a trusted workload. And then finally, it just wraps our git clone or whatever else we're going to run here. And we can see this reflected in our Intoto layout. So the layout is what's going to tell Intoto what each step should do, who's allowed to do that step as a functionary, and then what materials and what products are expected for each step. So everything here has to match what happens in our pipeline. For example, if our command doesn't match, Intoto will throw a warning. 
It won't outright fail because sometimes commands not matching is expected. There are some things you, you may, your variables that may vary that you just won't know ahead of time. But everything else, such as our materials, will fail and cause a hard failure on uh, verification. So for example, in our, in our clone stage, we are saying we don't need any materials. We should not have any materials because we're cloning. We're going to create everything in our uh, folder saying that we basically created, created the world when we clone. Then as part of our build stage, we're going to say our build command should be go build. And then our expected materials must match our products from our clone state. So this prevents any files from changing, any files from being added, things like that in between stages and making sure we only use files that we created in the clone step and our build step. And then the final part of the in toto stage is the inspection and verification. So by default, Intoto will look at every single metadata prevented by each of these steps, and it'll make sure that the materials and products match your defined rules. You can also define this inspection stage, which may do extra stuff that you define. So in our case, in our previous build image stage, we tarred up our file, our, our Docker image. And now we're going to say that this Docker image tar that we have now must match the one that was created from the build image stage. So if someone were to download a tarred copy of our image, they'd be able to verify with the signed metadata that the image they have was the same one that we created as part of our build process. The final part that we added is this root CAs. Uh, by def or currently today, Intoto allows you to sign metadata and verify functionaries with DPG and public private key pairs that are embedded in this layout. With our integration with Spiffy, we wanted to make sure that we could sign metadata with any key and certificate pair belonging to a trusted root. So as part of that, we added in the root certificate as part of the layout that'll then be signed by another trusted key, one that could be pre-shared between bill agents and uh, anyone who needs to verify in a separate out-of-band process. From there, each step we added to a cert constraint field too. This is saying that certain attributes of our certificate must match these things. So for example, the clone, any common name is okay. We want this specific URI in our certificate. And this is a spiffy ID that uh, will be in any key made by our uh, spiffy agent and provided to our builders. To show how Intoto can catch unexpected things from happening in your build process, you can take a look at this merge request I've opened. In here, I'm just adding a line after our main function. This is printing, this shouldn't be here as our opening statement in our main function. I'm doing this outside of Intoto run, so Intoto should have no idea this happened. If I take a look at our build pipeline for this merge request, I can see it's failing image verification. And if we take a look as to why, it's in failing the inspection step for artifact verification failed for step build. Materials may not go were disallowed by the rule disallow star. As part of our rules for verification or for our build stage, we said that everything uses materials had to match the products from our clone. Since that didn't, it got caught by the disallow star stage. You can distribute your Intoto metadata from these build stages so that anyone who gets your software and the metadata can verify that you are the one who built it and that they can trust it. When you start to combine Intoto with things such as reproducible builds and distributed builds, it really gives you a strong idea of maybe when a build environment has just diverged and is producing different builds, or maybe something malicious is going on in that build environment and you need to dig in deeper. If you want to play with our code, we've published it here on GitHub on the Boxbo and Toto Golang repo. Thank you, and I'll hand it back to Cole. Thank you for that excellent demo. As you can see, we built a, a system with both Intoto and Spire that allows us validity and trustworthiness of our software decoupled from the We'll be sticking around for any questions. Uh,